started drawing because of Roger Ebert's. Years ago, the famous Chicago movie critic published a column in which he explained that drawing was actually a big part of his writing life. This surprised me, but what he wrote, he said, what you draw is a unique and invaluable representation of how you saw in that moment, in that place, according to your abilities. I found this very exciting. He also said, if you abandon perfectionism, you will liberate yourself to draw your way. I was totally in. I was so ready to liberate myself. <clears throat> so I bought a pencil and a sketchbook, and I made a pledge to myself that I was going to draw something every day for a year, or a month, <laughs> or a week. You see how this is going, right? It was like a New Year's resolution made while drunk on New Year's Eve, <laughs> except I made it sober in February, <laughs> and March, and July. Every time I would start this, I just could not be consistent. I would get distracted, I would get discouraged, I would drift away from the practice. And this went on, I'm a little embarrassed to say, for a couple of years. But I kept drawing because of Linda Berry. So not that long ago on a podcast called Bullseye, I heard Linda Berry say that drawing is something that we all have as children, something that we all have in childhood, but something that most of us lose as adults. She also said that some people think you have to plan everything out before you draw, but you don't. She said, in fact, the people who don't plan often produce the most fantastic things. She also said, sometimes you have to mix it up. And I thought, oh, Linda, I am totally down. I want to mix it up. I am ready to produce fantastic things. So I went back to the drawing board. In this case, drawing board means my kitchen table. On September 28th, 2014, I sat down right before dinner, determined to draw, and I drew a piano. It's not a very good piano. Um, <clears throat> I was deeply concentrating on getting that arm that's holding up the lid just right and on the legs, and my husband said, oh, I have something I want to show you. And he handed me a pictorial biography of Gandhi, right? I didn't even really look at the book, though, because I was trying to decide whether I should draw 88 keys or just approximate a keyboard with two lines. You can see what choice I made. I think it was the right one. <laughs> uh, but that book was still sitting there the next night when I sat down to draw right before dinner. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, why not draw Gandhi? So I opened to a photograph that I really liked and I drew it. That was September 29th. On September 30th, book's still there, and I saw a different photograph. I drew Mohandas, the young London lawyer. That's a Gandhi nobody had ever seen, and I thought, I am on my way to liberation, baby. I am going to do this. <laughs> on October 1st, I was in a hurry. I don't remember why. All I know is what I wrote on the page opposite my third Gandhi. If you can't read that, what it says is, quit drawing because I'm stressed and miserable. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, October 2nd, I had a little more time, and I was starting to really get into my subject, which is clear because I, that was the first time I attempted those difficult folds of his shawl. October 3rd, my first turban, not Gandhi's first, but mine. Um, <laughs> October 4th, I drew his whole face, but this entire picture is really about the mustache. That is all I was concerned with at that point. Now, man, I am on a roll. I drew Gandhi every day in October. I drew Gandhi every day in November. At, at some point, this thing just took off in this way that I could not have anticipated. <laughs> by January 1st, uh, by January 1st, I had only missed one day. When I reached 100 Gandhi drawings, I stopped counting. 
A lot of people associate those glasses with the Mahatma, but let me tell you, I began to have a lot of opinions about the ears on which they rested. Oh, man. <laughs> I, uh, like I said, I can't explain it except to say that I was sort of entranced. I drew Gandhi walking, talking, giving speeches, just hanging out. I, <laughs> I, <clears throat> I, you know, it began to have this sort of momentum that it, it was like, again, like I said, it was like I was in a sort of trance. Um, I drew Gandhi as absentmindedly as often as I drew him deliberately. I was sort of very casual about it, except when I wasn't. I drew his profile on post-it notes and takeout boxes. Uh, I drew Gandhi basically on every blank surface I could find, including an Easter egg. <laughs> at some point, I'm at a children's birthday party, and somebody handed me an Etch-a-Sketch, not because they wanted me to use it, but because it was in the way of the cake. I spent the next two hours drawing Gandhi. Uh, that's not the Etch-a-Sketch one. This is the shadow portrait on a scratch pad. There's that Etch-a-Sketch. Woo! Uh, at some point, Alabama had one of its legendary winter storms. So when the snowpocalypse dumped a full one inch of snow on the hood of my Honda, I drew Gandhi's face there. In, uh, in 2015, I eased up a little bit. Instead of drawing Gandhi every day, I was just down to a couple of days a week. Uh, Lately, I am back at it, though, and I have been trying to sort out what this means. Um, I can tell you that when I started drawing Gandhi, I was teaching creative writing and journalism. And I spent a lot of time thinking about how those two modes intersect. Now, in some ways, it might make all of us feel a little anxious to imagine the Mahatma vamping for the camera. But he did. He was always a willing subject for photographers a guy who really understood that uh, the power of an image to get his message to the broadest possible audience. Um, I should tell you that, you know, as many of these drawings as I've done, I want to say that for me, these drawings are not about hero worship. I admire Gandhi quite a lot, but I must tell you that in two years of thinking about him and reading about him and drawing him over and over again, I have encountered all of that sainted man's sins. Turns out that being the change you wish to see in the world does not leave a lot of time to be an attentive husband or father. Uh, drawing Gandhi every day has absolutely made me feel closer to him. But I gotta tell you that some days I like him less than I would have anticipated. When I started doing this, if I had at any point, if, if I had planned this project, it never would have happened. It just absolutely would have tanked. Uh, if I had tried to design for myself a program of creativity, of discipline, of mindfulness, I would have been too overwhelmed to make a mark. But you know, one thing that kept coming back to me as I was drawing Gandhi over and over again is I kept thinking of something that he wrote to his son in 1935. So that year, Gandhi's in jail, not for the first time, not for the last, and he wrote a letter to his son and he said, don't get agitated if you have too much to do. And don't, try, don't worry about what you should do first. You will figure it out in practice if you are patient and if you take care of your minutes. <laughs> I thought, oh, if you are patient, that's the Mahatma challenge right there. But what it took me back to was Roger Ebert going, abandon perfection. Liberate yourself and represent what you see, where you are, as you can, according to your abilities. At this point, I'm making time. And now I'm drawing Gandhi still because there is a whole lot that I still want to see. Thank you.